Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. C.S. Lewis called this the most embarrassing verse of the New Testament, and we can see why. Jesus has just been describing his parousia, where he'll come and judge the nations and restore Israel. And he seems to predict the timing of his parousia, that it will happen before his contemporaries die. But of course, 30 to 40 years later, his contemporaries were mostly all dead, and yet Jesus hadn't come, hence the embarrassment. But we have good reasons to doubt that the verse means quite what it seems plainly to say. First of all, the evangelist, Matthew, from which we quoted it this time, but Luke and Mark also include the verse, the evangelists obviously don't see the verse as some kind of embarrassment, or at least one of them would have left it out among the three. When they record the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, So the very fact that they include it strongly indicates that they don't read it as if it's a prediction gone wrong. Secondly, verse 36, in the case of Matthew 24 anyway, uh, says clearly that as to the timing of Jesus' coming, nobody knows the timing, not even the Son So if verse 34 is a prediction about the timing of Jesus' coming, verse 36 is claiming nobody, not even Jesus, could predict the timing of his coming. So the two seem to be obviously in such great conflict and so close to one another that it seems like it's more likely one of them is being misread. A third reason to doubt that verse 34 is a plain prediction about the timing of Jesus' coming, is that the structure of the Olivet Discourse, its two parts, are divided based on the two questions the disciples have back in Matthew 24, verse 3. Their two questions are, number one, about the timing of Jesus' parousia, and number two, are there signs? What are the signs that his parousia is near? And in verses 4 to 35, he plainly answers the question about signs. Then in verse 36, it begins, now concerning the day and the hour. And there he begins to answer the question about timing. And that runs clearly all the way to the middle of chapter 25, where he adds parables and so on, all about the timing. So the structure of the Olivet Discourse, the first half is about the signs, The second half is about timing. So our verse, verse 34, and then verse 35, these verses are the climactic end of the first half of the discourse, not in the section where he's he's discussing anything about timing, which begins in verse 36. So you wouldn't expect him to be addressing the question of timing until verse 36 following. And then a fourth reason to doubt just in reading your English Bible, that the verse 34 must have a prediction about timing based on the plain meaning of the language. If you go back to the first English versions, like the Wycliffe translation into English, there we have examples where the word generation clearly cannot have its temporal meaning like we afford it today, but it must be something like family or kindred. For example, in Genesis 31, God says to Jacob, return to the land of thy fathers and to thy generation. And generation clearly there is not referring to his contemporaries, but referring to his family. And indeed, uh, the word generation originally in English could have the connotation of a qualitative connotation, or it could have a temporal connotation, all right? So you can't assume that in the English Bible tradition, or the translation tradition, that just because you see the word generation, that it automatically by itself has to have the temporal meaning. It could just have the qualitative meaning that is now obsolete, but it originally had, which is that it's referring to the family or the people of Israel, okay? That's just in English. That's also true in Greek. But before we get to the Greek, 
I want to just give you a, a kind of an analogy just to try and help your English mind think about the original Greek word here, yenea, which is translated as generation, okay? There's no disputing in the original Greek. I'm a classicist by training myself. There's no disputing that the original Greek word yenea could have a qualitative meaning or more of a, a stronger temporal connotation. But let's just think in English for a second just to help your, your English mind think about this. This family will enjoy watching the world championship even though mom and dad are rooting for opposite teams, okay? In that context, clearly the expression this family has a very strong temporal connotation. It means a particular family group who's all living at the same time who's going to watch a sporting event together, okay? If, however, I say, uh, imagine a, um, a great-grandfather speaking to his great-grandson who's in a ninth grader, and he says to him, this family will never prosper until it takes education more seriously, all right? In that context, this family isn't so strongly just a one group of people living at one particular time in history who have the, who are of the same stock human uh, of set of parents but rather now the great grandfather is talking about the family across many generations including his great grandsons sons and grandsons and great grandsons so there it's subtle but clearly in that context the expression this family would no longer have just this strict uh, connotation of a temporal connotation of a group living all at the same time, but would have a much larger trans, so to speak, generational uh, uh, meaning or atemporal connotation. Okay. And of course, we could do it, we could use yet another expression to broaden that out further, like this family has suffered great har hardship uh, ever since it arrived in this country in the 17th century. And now this family is again not temporal in its major, in its primary connotation, but qualitative, referring to a group across many, many generations. So, uh, Chris Austin uh, points this out as well. The early Greek church father points out that the word yenea can have this strong temporal connotation or have more of a qualitative connotation. So the question then really is which connotation does it have in Matthew 24? The very fact that he's even using this word, yenea, comes from the Greek Bible, or I should say the Hebrew scriptures originally and then translated into Greek. So the background to the word translated generation, whether it's the Greek word yenea or the Hebrew word dor or some of the other Hebrew words for that are translated yenea, like zera, the background for Jesus clearly is the Hebrew background, the Hebrew scriptures, and then also probably the ones translated into Greek. So we know this because in Matthew, not only just because of Jesus' milieu, the cultural milieu in which he lived, but also because in uh, Matthew 17, um, he, there's a story where he specifically alludes to an expression, including the word yenea, which is from Deuteronomy chapter 32, the twisted and faithless or the crooked and faithless yenea. And then there's other places too where Jesus uses yenea and then weaves into it these Old Testament ideas like the spiritual uh, adulterers of this yenea and so on. So all, uh, uh, all this is to show what commentators normally point out, which is the background to the word is probably from the Hebrew scriptures originally, and of course Deuteronomy 32 specifically. And the interesting thing there is that if you read Deuteronomy 32, it's quite clear that when Moses is talking about the yenea in the Greek tradition, or door in the Hebrew tradition, he is not speaking about one particular group of contemporaries. He is speaking about the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which are all used synonymously with the word generation or yenea in Deuteronomy 32. You can read it for yourself. Uh, it's pretty clear there that it's not the temporal connotation primarily, but the qualitative one of the group who are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as offspring, so to speak, yenea in the sense of offspring or a people or nation. Now, the first readers of Matthew, at least in the case of Justin Martyr in his dialogue with Trifo, he uses yenea this way in its qualitative meaning because he describes Trifo as belonging to the yenea, 
that Jesus is referring to in Matthew 12. So Justin Martyr reads Yeneya, not in its temporal sense so much, but in its qualitative sense, referring to the people of Israel. And also in Matthew 23, if we read uh, there where Jesus is talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, and he says, I'm going to send you to you, future prophets, and you're going to crucify some of them and flog some of them, and then therefore God's judgment will fall on you or will fall on, quote, this Yenea. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this Yenea. So you might think Jesus is referring to, his, to just his contemporaries, except that he has just stated that the reason your, the, the judgment is going to come upon you is because you killed Zechariah, son of Berechiah. But the, the, the martyrdom that he's referring to, the killing of this prophet, is clearly from centuries before. So how could Jesus speak to his contemporaries and say, you killed someone centuries before? Unless he is referring to this group here as if they embody the whole Yenea, the whole people, the whole nation uh, of, the, of those who were in rebellion against God across many, many generations. So in Matthew 24, verse 35 and 36, it seems quite plain that it would, that it would be very difficult to try and hold to the view that Yenea there has some sort of strict temporal meaning. It seems clearly to have a much broader meaning referring to the uh, offspring, so to speak, the brood, as Jesus describes them, like a hen gathers her brood under her wings. He wanted to gather them, these children. In Matthew 24, we have another reason to think that uh, Jesus is not speaking about the timing of anything when he says, Amen, I say to you, uh, this yeni I will not pass away before all these things are accomplished. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. Because when he says heaven and earth will pass away, my words will never pass away, he's, he's referring back to a saying that he used in Matthew 5 from the Sermon on the Mount. At least this is how surely the writer Matthew would view it. That earlier in this very famous sermon at the beginning where Jesus says, some of you will challenge me as if I've come to destroy the law and the prophets, but I haven't come to destroy them, I've come to fulfill them. And then he uses this saying, Amen, I say to you, and now I'm just going to slightly rework it so it makes more sense in natural English. Uh, every comma of Scripture will be fulfilled before heaven and earth pass away. So uh, the, the point is not that he's predicting the timing of when all of Scripture will be fulfilled. He's simply affirming the certainty of it. And heaven and earth will not pass away until every comma of Scripture is fulfilled. And you can see that is obvious. He's just affirming the certainty of it. He's not predicting the timing of anything. And then he joins that saying, slightly reworked, in verse 35 of Matthew 24 with Matthew 24, verse 34. And there's one, all men, I say to you, that leads into these two sayings. So the twin sayings are most likely just affirming the certainty of what is going to happen. And of course, the reason he's affirming the certainty of these things as a kind of quasi-oath at the end of the first half of the Olivet Discourse is because he's speaking to his disciples and he's just been laying out all of the omens and portents and all of the things that are going to happen to the nation of Israel and things that the disciples themselves will suffer as a result of. And he's encouraging them and trying to strengthen their faith and their confidence that as they go through and experience these various trials, which prove to be signs, actually, that the end is going to be fulfilled, is going to happen. There is going to be a grand restoration of the nation and so on. And encourage the disciples that all their efforts are worth it and to endure and to keep trusting him. He's clearly then just affirming the certainty of these things, that they can count upon these things. And then uh, the one final little note here, that there is a little word play here where he says, this Yenea will not pass away until all these things, Yenete, and you can hear it even in, in, into your English ear, Yenea and Yenete, the verb take place is, uh, is um, related to the, to the noun Yenea, so that in in English, it would be, it, it might sound more natural to see the connection to say something like, This 
uh, brood, this faithless brood, will not pass away until this program of restoration is birthed, okay? And I think the relationship here in the until clause, for those of you that know, know language a little better, uh, the, the relationship is not a temporal one. So the word until can have a, you can, you can temporally order clauses with the word in Greek eos in them, or you can do it logically. So, for example, when Jesus says to Peter, um, uh, the, the rooster will not crow until you deny me three times, that's a temporally ordered, ordered prediction. The, the time is the main thing uh, in ordering the two clauses together. But in, the, in, in, say, Matthew 5, verse 26, where Jesus says, Amen, I say to you, you will not be released from prison until the last penny is paid, until you pay the last penny. The point there is not a prediction about timing so much. They're not temporarily ordered, the clauses. It's simply saying the release is logically conditioned on the pain of the full fine. So in Matthew 24, verse 34, though we are in our minds because of the word generation are inclined to read it as a temporally ordered clause, I don't think it is. Yenea just means the brood or the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, and the clauses are ordered logically, meaning that the faithless offspring of Abraham and Isaac, the rebellious offspring, that people will um, not pass away until a new people are birthed, because there's going to be a restoration of the family of Abraham uh, at the coming of Jesus, who will welcome him. If you read chapter 23, verse 39, it says, you will not see me again until uh, this generation is uh, prepared to bless me uh, when I come. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, this anyway, these are my thoughts uh, and why I think the translation tradition is the way it is in English and how that shouldn't uh, pigeonhole us into one way of reading it temporarily. So what do you think? I'd be curious to hear.